Hello and welcome to today's webinar on researching New England planters who settled Nova Scotia after the Acadian deportation. My name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Vice President of Education and Programming here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's program. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. I do want to note that we are still broadcasting from our homes to yours with various limitations and distractions. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end, and we thank you for your patience. If we were to lose connection for any reason, not to worry, you will have access to a full recording of today's session. Our presenter today is a genealogist. Shayla Dorfler. Uh, Shayla received her BA in History and Communication from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Through her work with our research services team, she assists patrons um, breaking down brick walls and conducting research on their behalf. Her research interests include New England, New York, Ireland, Atlantic Canada, Quebec, Ontario, Norway, and Sweden. So chances are, if you're tuning into this presentation, you may have or you think you have uh, New England planter ancestors. So today we're going to be looking at um, or talking about kind of the historic context of who these planters are, why they came and why they settled Nova Scotia. And we'll also point you to several published and primary resources that can help you trace your New England planter roots. And at any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the Q&A panel. At the bottom of your screen, we'll address those at the end. There is a free syllabus for this session that can be downloaded or printed from our website. And a link to that uh, handout was included in your reminder emails. And I will also drop a link to that once again in the chat panel. Um, so that just has some uh, all of the uh, URLs, the full URLs that we'll be showing. Um, some more information. So don't feel like you need to be taking copious amounts of notes. Um, you will have that handout and you'll also have access to a full recording of this session uh, starting later today. So again, if you miss something on today's first listen, not to worry, you'll be able to watch it on our website as well as our YouTube channel. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Shayla. Thank you so much, Ginevra, and thanks to you all for joining me for researching New England planters to Nova Scotia. Over the course of this next hour, we will learn about the historical context uh, for the settlement of the planters in Nova Scotia and what resources we can utilize to best learn about this group. So the big question is, who were the New England planters? They are defined as those that were invited by the English crown to settle the vacated lands of the Acadians in Nova Scotia. And it's important to remember that this also includes the province of, no of New Brunswick. The bulk of the planters arrived between 1759 and then they taper off in the late 1760s. Um, and that's when the planter migration sharply drops off. Some argue that the planter migration extends up until the mid 1770s, just before the American Revolution. But the bulk of these folks are arriving in Nova Scotia between 1759 and about 1768. And it's really important to note that the term planter um, here, it's being used as a synonym for the um, for the term colonizer. So they're used um, hand in hand. And in, in, to uh, in total, about 8,000 people migrate from New England to Nova Scotia. As many of you at home may know that uh, Nova Scotia is a really difficult place to research, um, particularly in the 18th century. Um, and this is largely attributed to the, the poor and sporadic record collections available. Uh, it can be really difficult to confirm family groups and um, even more difficult to determine where our ancestors are coming from. But one of the biggest challenges is determining when and why an ancestor may have settled in Nova Scotia. And it's really important when we're researching in areas with poor record collections that we identify our ancestors' motivations for migrating. Um, this is really important uh, 
Um, because if we can identify those motivations, we can uncover new um, sources to examine. And, you know, again, this is really especially true of Nova Scotian research in the 18th century. I find um, there's a lot of confusion between the New England planters and loyalists. And just because you can place your ancestor in Nova Scotia in the 1780s, um, that doesn't mean that they are necessarily necessarily a loyalist. They could have arrived, you know, some 20 years prior with the New England planter migration, or they could be um, a settler migrating to Nova Scotia on their own accord for economic reasons. But before we can learn more about the planters, it's incredibly important to understand um, the colony of Acadia and its historical settlement. Now, this is a really, really complicated region. Um, uh, historically, a lot happens in Acadia during its um, over 100 years of, um, of presence in, in the Can uh, Canadian Maritimes. I'm going to give you a really brief overview of the region. So it's going to help us understand how the New England planters come to Nova Scotia. At the end of this section, um, I'm going to highlight our Acadian genealogy subject guide, and that is a fantastic source. It provides uh, a lot of sources for further reading. Um, so if you have more detailed questions about Acadia that I don't address, I suggest um, exploring that, that, that guide further. So in short, uh, Acadia is a colony of New France and it's established in 1604. It's the first permanent settlement of the French in North America. And it included uh, present day Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Cape Breton Island, Prince Edward Island, and portions of Eastern Maine. Uh, and over the course of the, the 17th century, century the French um, actively bring French Catholic settlers to populate the region. This is a really great map. It's one of the best that I've come across that depicts Acadia. You can see the historical settlements throughout the region and its borders. So we can see here that it encompasses Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Cape Breton. And we can also see that a uh, portion of Maine was part of Acadia as well. So that's generally considered the territory east of the Kennebec River. This region, it contained many uh, natural resources. So very fertile farmland, there's abundant fisheries and uh, animal resources for the incredibly lucrative fur trade. So, you know, in direct result, it's a really hotly contested region for the world powers of France and England. Um, the two world powers, they battle for control um, of this region in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and subsequently, you know, it's a really turbulent colony um, and control of Acadia and its resources change hands many times. Um, you know, the region's characterized by conflict, violence, and wars. Um, so again, if you have any specific questions about the, the many different conflicts that were fought in Acadia and portions of New England, I suggest consulting the guide that I will highlight soon. Uh, in 1713, England overcomes the French for control of Acadia for that final time. And this is upon the signing of the, the Treaty of Utrecht uh, during Queen Anne's War. And this signing, it, it triggers uprising amongst, amongst the French and native peoples who were allied uh, against the English crown. From this map, we can see the changing power dynamic in what is now the Canadian Maritimes. Um, you know, with the, the signing of that treaty, the English gained control of Nova Scotia uh, and uh, uh, Newfoundland. Um, Cape Breton and Prince Edward Island remain under French control. And, you know, we can see that um, that obviously is going to cause a lot of headaches going forward because these islands are incredibly close to one another. Um, and you have warring world powers with lots of resources, um, you know, populating, trying to populate each colony and taking advantage of each colony's uh, resources, which is going to lead to further conflict. Um, so it's a really tenu tenuous situation in the Canadian Maritimes. Um, and, you know, again, mostly because this is an incredibly abundant, um, abundant uh, region of natural resources that, are, that supports both um, the economies of both world powers. So after the signing of that treaty, the um, 
the English allow the, the French Catholic Acadians to remain on their lands. Um, you know, they're very, very wary of, of these Acadian settlers. Um, but initially, the English see them as an asset. They're very talented uh, farmers. They um, have established a lot of successful farming techniques, and they're also allied with the native peoples. Um, a lot of the native peoples, um, the Mi'kmaq um, people, eventually um, become Catholic, so they're, they're strongly tied to one another. So they're seen as productive settlers. But the one thing that the English want in return from the, the Acadians is um, the signing of an unconditional oath of allegiance to the English crown. Um, you know, the Acadians, again, they're, they're French Catholic extraction. So they're seen as a threat to the English interests in the region. The English fear that, you know, the Acadians would take up arms um, with the French against the English um, who were, you know, occupying the, the nearby territories of Cape Breton and, and, and Prince Edward Island. Um, so the Acadians refuse that unconditional oath um, but they do agree to sign a conditional oath that insists they would be exempt from fighting in any conflicts alongside the English against the French and the native peoples. So in 1730, that um, conditional oath is offered. Uh, and from then on, the Acadians um, are referred to um, those that sign the oath as the French neutrals. So we're jumping up ahead here um, to the to the mid 18th century. Uh, this is when um, a lot of activity happens in Acadia. The uh, the English continue to to try to populate the island and fortify the um, the island, and they're doing so in Acadian villages, um, and they're um, consistently bringing over Protestant settlers um, to settle Nova Scotia. During this time. Halifax is founded as a British administrative and military center, and it, its founding is seen as a direct violation of a 1720s peace treaty. Um, so this is sort of seen as one of the catalysts of the breakout of Le Loutre's war. Um, so Father Jean-Louis Jean Le Loutre, he leads forces of Acadian militia and allied Mi'kmaq people against the English in 1749 and 1755. Um, so just before the French and Indian War starts, and this war um, includes numerous conflicts throughout the island. The English eventually prevail at the Battle of Beausejour in 1755, and that ends the war. And, you know, the, the, this battle and the defeat of Lillator, it's really seen as one of the catalysts for the Acadian deportation. The English um, attest that Many Acadians, though they did not take up arms and join La, La Loutre, um, they, they had supplied them with supplies and intelligence. So that's seen as breaking that conditional oath that they had signed that uh, the Acadians wanted to maintain, maintain neutrality. So again, you know, there's this, this, this theme of the English being incredibly suspect of these Acadians because of their French and Catholic um, origins. And this is sort of seen as kind of the last straw. So again, the Acadians are, you know, seen as a military threat to the English crown. They're arguing that they're, they're aiding, um, actively aiding, um, uh, the enemy and they're breaking the neutrality. Uh, after the end of the war, they ask Acadians to sign a, a conditional, uh, an unconditional oath of allegiance, and um, many would not sign. So again, this is sort of seen as, as the last straw here. And you know, these ideas for deporting um, the Acadian people had been brewing for years. Um, you know they were seen as um, a problem and a problem that wouldn't go away um, with the continued wars and outbreaks and, and, and uh, violence throughout um, Nova Scotia. And so the plans for removing the Acadians really start to take hold in the 1750s. And one of the biggest proponents is Charles Lawrence, who eventually becomes um, the governor of Nova Scotia. He's kind of seen as one of the architects of the deportation. So after the fall of Fort Beausejour, the English um, order the deportation of the Acadians, again, Governor Charles Lawrence. 
He spearheads this campaign. He's also um, going to play a major role in bringing the New England planters to Nova Scotia. He works with the Nova Scotia Council um, and organizes the, these deportations that begin in 1755. Um, so the campaigns run from 1755 to 1760. Um, the first groups are sent to the North American colonies. So um, primarily, you know, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New York, and South Carolina. Um, it's a really terrible and violent deportation. Settlers are rounded up and threatened. Uh, property is destroyed so that to ensure that Acadians would not come back and resettle. Um, it's a really sad chapter in, in English and Canadian history. Um, you know, those that were able to uh, flee, flee to Cape Breton and Prince Edward Island where the French are maintaining colonies. Um, but these Acadians are eventually deported to um, in the end, more than 10,000 Acadians are deported. Uh, thousands die of disease um, and drowning when their ships are lost. And those that do survive um, live, as, live, at, live as exiles for many years. So this is the, the subject guide that I've been referring to. And there's the link at the bottom here. Um, so if you are interested in reading more about Acadian genealogy, this is a really fantastic guide that's put together by Tricia Labby. Um, there's timelines, more detailed um, information about all of the conflicts leading up to the deportation of the Acadians um, and lots of resources to pursue. So now that we have that historical context and we understand um, what's going on in Acadia, Nova Scotia, um, we can talk about uh, the New England planters. So, you know, the English are actively seeking to populate Nova Scotia with Protestants and quote unquote planting people. Uh, it's a really common practice of the British crown. Um, it's something they did in, in Ulster Plantation in, in Northern Ireland in the 1600s to quell the, the native Irish Catholic population. And it's a tactic that the English would continue to practice in other Canadian provinces too. The real, the real um, theory behind this is they wanna secure control over the region and you know, reduce the threat from the, the French Catholic and native peoples. Um, you know, the French are just nearby. Um, they are, you know, holding massive swath of territory and they're a very real threat. So to secure Nova Scotia, um, they wanna bring Protestant settlers. And a couple of schemes are uh, considered, one of them that is successful um, is uh, in the 1740s, uh, French Lutherans and German Protestants are brought to, um, to Nova Scotia. And some of these folks are known as the foreign Protestants. Again, we're coming back to Governor Charles Lawrence, who is a huge figure in both the Acadian deportation and the settlement of the New England planters. He rises to governor of Nova Scotia in 1753. Um, and again, in, in the years after the deportations begin in 1755, you know, he and the Nova Scotia um, Council and um, the powers that be in England are coming up with immigration schemes to bring people to the province. Uh, one of the more attractive schemes was to bring New Englanders to Nova Scotia. Um, so New Englanders, you know, they're seen as, you know, a really hardy, hardy, reliable, successful group of, um, you know, farmers and fishermen, uh, and most importantly, Protestants. Um, so they're thought to be a kind of a good fit. And sort of this theory comes out of Lawrence's relationship with Massachusetts Governor William Shirley. Um, so he's he's um, aided English in their efforts to defeat the French in Acadia. He's also considered one of the the architects of the deportation, um, and and one of his um, one of his um, parts of what something called his great plan is to bring thousands of of these New Englanders up to take over the vacated Acadian lands. So Lawrence waits a couple of years after the, the initial deportation, um, after the England's victory at the siege of, of Louisbourg in 1758 during the French and Indian War. So that's when um, the English take control of Cape Breton Island. So this triggers the meeting of uh, the Nova Scotia Assembly working with Lawrence to, um, to consider these immigration plans and to really get them underway. 
So to get the word out, several proclamations are published in New England. The first is issued on 12 October 1758, and it's published in the Boston Gazette on 6 November 1758. And here we can see uh, portions of that proclamation here. Uh, Lawrence is inviting proposals for land that had been vacated by the Acadians. He's highlighting that, um, you know, the destruction of the French settlements along the, the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Bay of Fundy. So letting folks know that kind of the uh, that the French threat is no longer there. Um, you know, the lands are described as upwards of 100,000 acres of plowable lands and 100,000 acres of upland. Um, and instructions are given to, um, to folks on how to apply. But, you know, this is a really vague proclamation. A lot of New Englanders are very skeptical of the initial proclamation because it doesn't really apply uh, supply any details for um, the condition of settlement. So a bunch of questions are directed to Lawrence's agents in Boston and New York, uh, and then another proclamation is ordered. This is the more well-known proclamation of January 11, 1759. Um, and here it uh, addresses all of the questions that New Englanders had. Um, so again, there will be the establishment of 100,000 acre townships. The head of household received 100 acres and then any additional 50 acres for each family member. They limited that at 1,000 acres because they didn't want to have land speculation um, up in Nova Scotia where um, folks on, sat on giant tracts of land. The land had to be cultivated and there would be no quit rent for the first 10 years. So no land tax for the first 10 years. They also provided some guarantees. Um, these were some of the biggest concerns of the New Englanders. It guaranteed religious freedom to everyone but Catholics, the right to erect a, a meeting house and select a minister. Another key point was representation in the Nova Scotia Assembly, which was, was seen as incredibly important to um, these New Englanders. And then no initial tax. So we we're talking about that quit rent. Um, so after 10 years, uh, a land tax would be applied. So why would any New Englander be interested in leaving New England for Nova Scotia, um, you know, a province that they've never seen before? Well, in truth be told, there's a there's a population explosion in New England. Um, you know, we're talking about the, you know, the late 1750s here. So, you know, 130 years of immigration to New England and um, also population growth too. Um, folks are having large families. So this, leads to a real lack of available lands. New England becomes really crowded. Um, you know, folks are kind of pushing west and north away from the coast into the interior of New England, searching for, um, you know, good open farmland and it's in short supply. So that means, uh, you know, less opportunity for anyone. So it, this is essentially, these New Englanders are land hungry. And they are seeing these, um, you know, fertile farmlands that were taken from the Acadians as um, a, a way forward to, um, you know, successfully farm and, and fish and, and grow their families and be successful people. Uh, most of the New England planters are coming from Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. And it's, you know, it's not a surprise that these are the most congested uh, regions of New England. Um, so that's where you see the bulk of these planters coming from. And this is a question that I get asked a lot. Is my ancestor a New England planter? Um, and, and so these are some of the, the big clues that would suggest that your ancestor was part of this migration to Nova Scotia. Um, if they settled in Nova Scotia or modern day New Brunswick in the 1750s or 1760s, that's when that big influx um, from New England arrives in Nova Scotia. Um, and if they interacted with other proven New England planters, um, again, you see, we're seeing chain migration from New England. So chain migration is essentially when um, a settler follow, follows a, a neighbor or a family member from home to a new location. Um, it's incredibly common um, migration um, pattern and it's likely occurred in everyone at home's family trees. Um, you know, these New England planters, they're often um, 
neighbors from home. A lot of these townships are established by close family groups and neighbors from the same town, nearby towns, county. These are a really insular group of folks. So there's a lot of interaction, um, intermarriage between these, these groups. So if you find your, your ancestor kind of interacting, maybe buying or selling land from a New England planter or marrying into one of these planter families, there's a good chance that your ancestor is also a New England planter. The other clues too are is, um, you know, they're kind of settling in these New England planter townships. Um, so these are kind of the big ones here in Nova Scotia um, that have a strong New England planter ties. And portions of New Brunswick, New Brunswick as well along the St. John River Valley and then in the town surrounding Sackville. So again, if you find your ancestor here, possibly living, you know, sometime in the 1780s, and you're not sure if they're a loyalist or a New England planter, um, because they're living in these regions that are, you know, highly populated by planters, there is the chance that they, you know, are arriving before the American Revolution and are actually New England planters. This is really, I think, one of the best maps uh, depicting the, the, um, New England planter townships. It comes from They Planted Well, um, by, which is edited by Margaret Conrad. That is a, a must consult source. It's on the bibliography on the handout. I've, hi I've highlighted some of the important articles in that, um, but it's a great source for further reading. Um, so we can see, you know, many are clustered along the Bay of Fundy, along the North Shore of Nova Scotia. Some of these um, townships are are corresponding to the lands that were taken by the Acadians, taken from the Acadians. So, um, you know, the Minas Bay there, um, which is, you know, where we see the towns of Cornwallis and, and Horton, things like that, where a lot of um, Acadian folks were living. Um, so we kind of see them cluster together. And then some others st stood apart like Yarmouth and Barrington on the heel of, of Nova Scotia on the very bottom. These are heavily populated with New England planters. So now let's talk about resources. So what are the resources that we can examine to help us learn more about these ancestors and determine if they are actually New England planters? This is one of the premier sources, uh, Planters and Pioneers. It's by Esther Clark Wright. And it chronicles settlers to Nova Scotia from 1749 to 1755. So before and after the influx of these New England planters. Um, Esther Clark Wright is, um, you know, well lauded scholar in this New England planters and loyalists um, uh, genealogical circles and in, in, in Canadian maritime research. She sees the need um, to highlight these folks that were kind of all lumped together as pre loyalists. So anyone that was kind of coming to Nova Scotia before the American Revolution. Um, so this is a great source. It not only highlights the planters, but also, you know, the foreign Protestants are that are coming and anyone else um, that's kind of coming on their own volition is kind of included in this. She uses primary sources to construct these bios. So she's looking at township records, deeds, probate records, censuses, um, you know, really quality sources, you know, and not all of, um, none of these, these um, sketches are cited. So I suggest confirming the information with primary sources to get you get your hands on, but it, it's a very accurate source. Again, whenever we're looking at published works that are not cited, we always want to do our own due diligence by looking at primary sources like vital records, land records, probate records to confirm the information. The beginning of this book has really important information about the founding of each of the townships. Um, and again, she does a great job of, of explaining uh, the context for the settlement, the establishment of these townships. And like I said before, a lot of these townships are settled by people from the same communities in New England. So if you find your ancestor in Horton Township and you don't know where they're coming from, read the beginning of this um, this source to determine who founded Horton and um, odds are that your ancestor could be from that location. So this is a closer look at the sketches here. Um, if we just take a closer look at Moses Shaw, um, you know, we can see he first settles in, in Granville Township sometime in the 1760s. 
She's identifying his birth and origins as well as his, his two marriages and his children. Um, so again, this is an incredibly useful source um, because we have all this information here that you can go off and try to confirm on your own. Um, you might notice some uh, Mayflower names in these sketches. A lot of planters are originating from southeastern Massachusetts, so from Barnstable and Plymouth counties. Um, and you may see some names affiliated with, with Mayflower family. So Shaw and Finney uh, are good examples here. Um, these are both Mayflower lines. So when you're doing your research up in Nova Scotia, you're going to come across Nickersons and Dones and Snows and classic names that are affiliated with the Mayflower passengers. Um, so again, if you have New England planter ancestry, it is very, very possible that you have Mayflower ancestry too. Um, I know maybe some of you at home are attending this webinar because you're trying to do um, Mayflower research. So it's considered, you know, a Mayflower hotspot. So don't forget that as you're, as you're doing your research. Um, so she does a great job of including the information, every kind of piece of information she can here. Um, this source is available to borrow on archive.org. Um, we have it in the NEHDS library. Um, if you're doing a lot of Nova Scotia research, I highly re recommend purchasing a copy for your library. This is the first source that I look at before I do anything else, and it's a great springboard into um, primary sources. The other vital um, source that you need to look at are township books. Um, so the New England planter townships, they adopt the New England model of town record keeping. So these township books are very, very much like New England town records. Um, they contain vital records and information on town administration. So what I really wanna highlight here is that you can find land division information within these township books. So that's something that's really important to look at. You may find your ancestor uh, receiving a share in the township. Um, so don't forget to look at these township books here. There are lots of publi published um, collections of these township records too. I like to use them in conjunction with the originals to help navigate the, um, the source in a more efficient manner. We have a lot of township books at NHES. Some have been digitized on FamilySearch but the bulk of them live up at the Nova Scotia archives. And, and just a final note here, if your ancestor um, settled in what is now New Brunswick, some of these communities also have township books too. Um, so don't forget to look for that. And, I'll, and these next few, few slides, we'll take a closer look at those. This is, in my opinion, the best place to learn about the township records. Um, this is a guide that's on the Nova Scotia Archives website. I use this site to learn about what is available to me um, and, you know, how, you know what's, what's available, what's in each um, township book. Um, and then, you know, not a lot of us can make it up to Nova Scotia. So um, you can then search Family Search or uh, visit the NHS library to look at the originals. So when you search by community, this is what you get. And this is for Barrington Township here. Um, and we can see that it, it breaks down what is in each of these township books. And so, you know, the first book is, is gonna be the most attractive here. Some of these dates um, come date to the 1760s um, and they include land divisions here. So when my New England planters are gonna be their most active. So, um, and we can also see uh, at the, the top here, someone's created an index too. Patricia A. Terry has created a Barrington Township Records Index. So that's really important to know because um, like New England Town Records, these are not all, have not all been indexed by the town clerk when they were done. So it's really great when these indexes are available because you can look at them much more efficiently, but this is, you know, whenever I'm researching in a community, I always come to this guide to learn about what's available in, in each of these township record books. And again, um, highlighting again what I said before about New Brunswick is that a lot of these, those planter townships in New Brunswick also adopted the New England model of record keeping because they were founded by New Englanders. So you'll see what's available um, 
here too as well. So um, because New Brunswick was a part of Nova Scotia until 1784, they hold a lot of early New Brunswick collections. And then we can also see the other locations. Um, it's held also at the Library and Archives Canada too. So um, it's a great way to, to smartly research these collections to understand what you're looking at um, and you know what's available to you before you start browsing each page. And then this is just an example of the Horton Township records too. Um, they feature vital records. These are often going to be organized by family. Um, so much like the organization of vital records um, that you um, encounter in other New England towns. Um, again, some township records um, have corresponding published collections of their vital records too. Um, you'll find quite a few at the NEHDS library um, and then even some in the family search catalog. So um, again, you always want to be looking at the original, but um, you know, if you can find an index or a published collection that'll help you navigate them, um, it's the, you know, the better for you. Early census returns are another really key source to help determine if your ancestor is settling in Nova Scotia before the American Revolution. So that's, you know, the distinction between the New England planter and the loyalist. Um, these are all housed at the Nova Scotia archives. We can see on the right hand side here, um, the Nova Scotia archives holds a lot of early census and tax records that are incredibly helpful. So the first um, census that notes the head of household is, is in 1770. Um, and again, that will squarely place your ancestor before the American Revolution. Uh, not all of the census records are complete. So if you um, click that first link here, it says click here for the file list of communities included in this collective census. It'll give you a list of um, the communities that are available for each census year. So we can we see a census return here. This is my ancestor Moses Shaw, um, who was highlighted in uh, Esther Clark Wright's Planters and Pioneers. These are really detailed census records. Um, they note how many men, women, and children are included in each family. And then, you know, really most interestingly, they um, also include their country of origin. So there's uh, sections for English, Scottish, Irish. Americans or other foreigners. Uh, and then again, it talks about agricultural holdings. And in that final column, there's also uh, information about how a household has changed. So if someone has passed away or someone was born. Um, so again, if your ancestor is showing up on the census and is marked as an American, there's a very strong chance that they're a New England planter. Um, so again, this is another key source that I always examine when I'm doing New England planter research. And a source that you know cannot be overlooked, the reason why the planters are coming to Nova Scotia is for land. And when we're looking at land grants, um, you know, the best collection in my opinion are the Nova Scotia Crown Land Grant Registers. Um, there's a couple of places you can look for these land grants, but I find this to be the most comprehensive and um, you know, best organized collection because it, it can, contains a cumulative land grant index. So an index of all of the crown land. So the land that was given out by the English crown that was owned by the English crown that's granted to these settlers uh, is included in this index. And you can um, access it on Family Search. You can come to the NEHGS library or you can uh, examine it at the Nova Scotia archives. So this is the the collection on family search. Um, and here's a URL. Um, most of the collection is available to view online. Some of it has not been digitized. Um, but generally speaking, there is an index that you can look at to determine if your ancestor received a crown land um, from the English crown. Um, and again, if your ancestor is settling in modern day New Brunswick, these land grants would also be folded underneath these Nova Scotia Crown land grant registers too. So again, another crucial primary source uh, to examine to learn more about your ancestors' immigration to Nova Scotia. And a lot of early township land grants um, are found in this collection. So the, the earliest um, land grants are, are going to be organized by township. So 
you know, when Charles Lawrence um, puts out the proclamation, he has plans in order to establish, um, I believe it is 13 original planter townships. Um, and so they're surveyed and laid out. And so these original township land grants um, are going to be found under these crown land registers. And what we have here on the left is uh, a description of the grant. So it describes the property, um, its bounds and its meets. Um, and you know, it's it's kind of a lot of technical jargon here too, but it's worth a read to, you know, they're pretty interesting to read. Uh, and then a couple of pages down is the list of all the grantees for the township of Cornwallis, which is a New England planter hotspot. Um, it's where a lot of New England planters um, end up. And so again, if you're struggling to figure out if your ancestor is, uh, you know, where they're coming from, say you find them in the township of Cornwallis in 1765, you have no idea where they're coming from. Um, you know, this list of, of individuals is incredibly important because you can research these individuals by using planters and pioneers to determine where they're all coming from. And if you can identify several common places of origin amongst these folks, you can then search for your ancestor in that way. Again, you know, New England, these New England planters, they're, uh, they're an insular group of folks. They are interacting with each other. They are following each other um, to these new townships. Um, so again, whenever, and I can't say this enough, whenever you're researching in a place with poor record collections, like Nova Scotia, it's really important to understand the context of why someone is settling there and then the history of the settlement. Um, learn about those migration patterns um, because you may be able to fit your ancestor within one of them. You could also uh, examine Crown land grant maps at the Crown Land Information Man Management Center at that link below. So you can click on any one of these quadrants here and you'll get a map that'll show some of the grants that were given out. I find that not all of the land grants are included on here, but many of them that are um, will give you a book and a page number that corresponds to the Crown land grant registers that I just highlighted. I'm a really visual person, so I, I like looking at maps and I find these to be, to be really helpful too. So it's just another way to, to learn more about land holdings. Another source are the, the Nova Scotia land papers. Um, you can find these digitized uh, at the Nova Scotia archives. Um, this collection begins in 1765, so the very tail end of the planter migration up to Nova Scotia. But um, again, if you want to, to confirm that you're doing an exhaustive search, I would look at this collection as well. It contains pe petitions that are being made to the government. Most of this collection is going to be pertinent to the loyalists coming after the American Revolution. But again, um, it's always important to try to do the most exhaustive search possible. Um, NHGS library also maintains a copy of this collection too. So um, again, just be certain to take a look, a quick look here too. Church records are another source that you um, can utilize to learn more about your New England planter uh, ancestors. They are pretty sporadic, um, but again, it's something that you should always try to pursue to see if they are available for the community that you're researching. The most complete collection um, are at the Nova Scotia archives. Um, local churches also maintain these um, collections, as well as the, um, the regional archives for whatever denomination that you are um, researching. Um, Family search has sporadic collections as well as the NEHGS library. Again, it's not often a source that you can really count on to put your family groups together, but it's um, you know, something that you have to um, pursue to, to determine if there is a collection that you could look at. The, the guide that's um, held at the Nova Scotia Archives is the best place to determine if there is a pertinent collection for the town that you're researching. Um, again, it's at that URL below here. So you can just type in if you're um, you know, researching um, Barrington to see if there are church records that date to the 1760s. Um, again, not all of us can get up to, to Nova Scotia to look at these 
um, microf microfilms um, church records, but it gives you an idea of what's available. So then you could write to the local church, you could come to the NHS library or look at our catalog or look on family search to see if they've been digitized. County uh, land and probate records should not be overlooked. These are incredibly important sources that are going to help connect your generations in the absence of church and vital records. Um, but more importantly, they, they help put your ancestor in a specific place at a specific time. So again, it's helping us to, defi to define when they're arriving in Nova Scotia. Um, and it's also going to reveal who your ancestor is interacting with. Um, again, I spoke about one of the clues that may hint at, um, hint at your ancestor being a New England planter is if they're interacting with other New England, you know, proven New England planters. So if you're researching in Kings County and you find your ancestor, um, you know, interacting with several folks that have been confirmed um, by Esther Clark Wright as a, you know, arriving from New England in the 1750s or 60s, that might be a big clue for you that your, your ancestor is also um, part of this migration. Many are digitized on FamilySearch. We have a really fantastic collection at NEHGS. And then they're also available at the, the Nova Scotia archives and the provincial archives of New Brunswick. Um, so don't forget to fold these into your research. This is um, you know, kind of an obscure and overlooked collection, um, but it should be considered nonetheless. And it's the minutes of the Nova Scotia Council. So the council advised the governor um, on his decisions. So, you know, when Charles Lawrence was considering immigration schemes and plans for deporting um, the Acadians, he conferred with the council. And so their minutes, you know, a lot of it is, is administration and political things of that nature, but they also contain info on land grants too and petitions. Um, so it's worth a peek at them, just in case you, if you strike out on finding um, a land grant or any sort of, um, you know, evidence in county land records. And there's a really helpful finding aid here. Um, you know, everything is, the bulk of the collections I'm talking about are located up in Nova Scotia, but this is a really great finding aid that can give you a clue if you need to pursue these further. Uh, Acadia University maintains the Planter Studies Center. This is a, a really interesting um, website that will give you some information on migration. They have a little planter database that you can learn more about, um, you know, type in your ancestor's last name to, to if they have collections relating to your ancestor. But most importantly is this publications tab here. Um, they uh, produced a newsletter called Planter Notes that um, it's digitized and you can go through and learn about um, there's some profiles on genealogical profiles on families as well as lists of sources um, and they are um, responsible for producing a lot of the works that are edited by Margaret Conrad that are listed on the handout that I've um, suggested for further research so a great um, website to, to to bookmark and pursue. Another really neat collection is New Englanders in Nova Scotia. These are genealogical article, articles that were published in the Yarmouth Herald, so Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, by Fred uh, E. Crowell in the 1920s and 1930s. And what he did was he created um, genealogical sketches of more than 650 families um, who began settling in Nova Scotia at the beginning of the planter migration in 1759. He donated his materials to NEHGS. So if you are interested in looking, um, looking at them further, you can um, book a, a, an appointment at the library and take a look at this collection. But most importantly, they're digitized on Amer uh, AmericanAncestors.org. So you can take a look at it at home. And this is how it, how it appears here. Um, there are clippings of what appeared in, in the, um, the Yarmouth Herald and they're organized by family. And so what he did was tried to, um, tried to extend the family to the immigrant ancestor. Um, it talks about their origins in New England and then brings each, each family down. Um, again, it's not cited, 
um, but it does give you avenues to pursue to um, verify that information um, with primary sources. It's, you know, it's definitely a source that's not to be overlooked. Um, and uh, again, you can, you can check it out on our website. Another fantastic source are the diaries of, of Simeon Perkins. He is um, a New England planter from Connecticut. He settles in Liverpool, uh, Nova Scotia, and he maintains diaries that span from 1766 to 1812. Um, they're available at the NHS library and on archive.org. You can borrow them. So he, he writes a lot about um, you know, politics and economy in Nova Scotia, you know, everyday events like, you know, the weather um, and things going on in his personal life. But he also records vital records. So you will find births, marriages and deaths in there. Um, and it's a neat source too, because it gives you um, some historical context um, regarding the everyday lives of, of our New England planter ancestors. Um, there's also a helpful um, diary of Simeon Perkins extracts by Muriel Davidson. And so that just has highlighted all of the genealogical data that he has mentioned in his diaries. Um, and you can take a look at that source at NEHGS. So here's just a, a quick, um, you know, snapshot of an ent entries from 1767. Um, and you can see here that um, he, he has several mentions of um, uh, January 21st, the wife of the wife of Nathan Tupper Jr. dies um, in convulsions after childbirth. So it's very possible that you know a death record. I mean, it's very likely that death record would not be recorded for the wife of Nathan Tupper in 1767, um, Nova Scotia. So this is probably the only record of her death. So take a close look, close look at this. Um, you know, my New England planter, planter ancestors are, are definitely highlighted in here and they were not prominent citizens. They were just kind of everyday uh, fishermen, but they appear in these um, diaries. Again, we're talking about small insular uh, townships where everyone's knowing everyone, everyone's interacting with everyone. So um, there's a good chance that your ancestor could appear. The Chipman papers are another, I think, over, in my opinion, overlooked source. Um, they mainly document the generations of the Chipman family of, of Cornwallis Township, but you'll also find documents um, relating to a lot of the residents of nearby townships folded within these papers. Um, there's a lot of information regarding like legal matters, so um, court records, affidavits, things like that. They're a part of this collection. Um, and so if your ancestor kind of lived on uh, in in Horton, Cornwallis, Fal Falmouth, or Newport, um, I would take a, a closer look at this. There's a searchable database on the Nova Scotia Archives, which is which is highlighted here. Um, so again, you can search for your um, your ancestor here. Um, you can also on the right hand column you can learn about what is available in the collection, and then you know, just browse by digitized documents as well. Not everything has been digitized. I think they're still actively putting this collection together. Um, but again, when you're working in a region with really poor vital records, it's important to consider uh, every collection available to you. And here's just a, a quick example of someone else, you know, normal folks being featured in these Chipman family papers. It's an, an arrest warrant. And you'll find these to be pretty um, common in these collections. Um, uh, but again, it's, you know, placing your ancestor in a particular place at a particular time, and also revealing their associates too. Um, and finally here, um, don't forget to look at our Nova Scotia um, subject guide. Um, it's compiled by David Allen Lambert and it serves as a really fantastic resource for how-to guides, um, you know, available records, more information about some of the sources that I talked about today. Um, I have a lot of these bookmarks so they're, they're quick and easy to access to, um, to make sure that I'm understanding what is available to me before I go ahead and, and dive and look at all these different uh, collections. And these are, in my opinion, the, the two best bibliographies 
that will aid you in your New England planter research. Um, so Judith Norton's um, bibliography of primary sources is incredibly important. There are a lot of smaller um, and kind of obscure collections that relate to um, regions and families. So um, we have this in the NEHGS library. I highly recommend looking at it. Um, again, you always want to make sure you're doing an exhaustive search. So, um, you know, her source is a is kind of the cream of the crop. And then the the checklist of secondary sources too, as well, will give you a guide for um, you know, local histories, genealogies, things like that. Um, so again, if if you're in the NHS library, we have both of them. Um, but if you can pick up copies, I would suggest doing that as well. And um, both of these articles are featured in um, They Planted Well, which I spoke about earlier, which is edited by Margaret Conrad. These two articles do a really good job of, um, you know, explaining in detail um, the coming of the New England planters to Nova Scotia. Um, you know, I gave you a very brief overview, but there's a lot more information um, that's kind of packed into these articles. So if you have, you know, questions, um, you want to know more about the subject, these, um, these are some of the best sources. Um, Barry Cahill, not only does he do a really great job of giving context for um, the settlement of the planters, this, um, this article also features uh, more sources that you can look at. They're all, most of them are, are at the um, Nova Scotia archives, but some of them have been digitized and are available elsewhere. So this, this is kind of the Cahill's article serves as a source of information for context, as well as sources that you can pursue further. And, you know, these are just some of the helpful websites that I highlighted today, you know, the provincial archives for Nova Scotia, and for, um, for New Brunswick, and uh, the um, Library and Archives Canada, which is, you know, the, the National Archives. And canadiana.ca is a really um, great website too. The, um, a lot has been digitized and has been um, put up there. So sometimes you'll find collections that you, you know, you think are housed at the local provincial archives. They've actually been digitized and put up there too. So, you know, that's a, definite website that I have bookmarked. I always double check it to see if I can get my hands on something and examine it at home. All right. Well, thank you so much, Shayla, for that very informative, uh, very comprehensive presentation. Um, so now let's take some questions. Again, if you have anything that you'd like to ask, go ahead and type it into the Q&A panel. We'll try to get to as many as we can, but of course, um, we won't get to everything. So we do have a few options um, if you need more assistance after uh, today's presentation. Um, just as kind of a background information, Betty asks, um, was part of Quebec also part of Acadia, or is Quebec a completely separate colony during this time? Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a separate colony. Um, so Acadia was really um, kind of included the Canadian Maritimes and, and parts of, of Maine. So that map, that first map that I showed you from, um, uh, that highlighted the um, historical township. So it's really, you know, if we think about it, it's it's Maine and, and the Canadian Maritimes is what's considered Acadia. And uh, several people are asking about either records of, you know, documenting the names of the ships that carried uh, New England planters to Nova Scotia, if we know what ships uh, transported these folks, or if there are passenger lists that are available for this time? To my knowledge, the, the passenger records are really sc um, scarce. If they were um, available, they would show up in Esther Clark Wright's Planters and Pioneers. Um, you know, there is definite um, evidence of groups of planters coming together on the same ship. Um, but a lot of that information is, is going to appear maybe in, you know, the minutes of the Nova Scotia Council or in some of these um, secondary sources that I highlighted. Um, I know there's examples of 
groups of uh, Rhode Island planters um, that were kind of organized and put on ships and, and brought together. Um, but again, it's if if it does exist, it's going to show up in Esther Clark Wright's Planters and Pioneers, um, as she was a you know she was a very exhaustive genealogist, so she you know examined as many primary source collections and, and tried to make the sketches as rich as possible. We also have a, a question about, you know, um, was it common for New Englanders to settle in Nova Scotia and then come back after uh, one or two generations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a, the New England planters, a lot of them, you know, come to Nova Scotia and they absolutely thrive. Um, and they have, you know, large families and there are still folks up there that are still, you know, living on the original planter um, land grants. But a lot of folks did, did come back. Um, you know, they either weren't successful, um, you know, the, the economy in Nova Scotia declines in the 1760s, um, you know, so they do bounce back to Nova Scotia. Um, and again, you know, many um, of these descendants of the New England planters eventually come back to Nova Scotia too in, you know, in the 18 and, and 1900s to kind of completing that reverse migration, which is, um, you know, definitely true of my own family. Um, but again, it's, I'd say most of the planters stay up there and do really well, but there are folks that um, you know, come back, um, or they migrate to points, uh, you know, west. Sometimes you see folks go to New Brunswick. Some sometimes you see kind of folks go back to northern New England and, and continue to migrate to points west. And uh, Chris asks, as loyalists begin to arrive in Nova Scotia, are there any kind of notable conflicts with those existing planters? I mean, how do they kind of interact and get along? Um, that's a very good question. Um, you know, it's not something that I know a lot about off the, the top of my head. Um, I do know that, you know, when the, when the loyalists are invited to settle in um, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, um, they are kind of granted lands that are a little bit separate from the planters. So the planters are really kind of ice, you know, jammed into these townships. Um, and there are open lands that are kind of given to the loyalists. So just how they're kind of like hotspots for New England planters, there are also hotspots for the um, for uh, the loyalists as well. So, you know, I don't think that they're competing for land because there were, you know, huge swaths of land still available. Um, there's a great source that I put on the handout called the Neutral Yankees, um, and that talks about uh, the New Englander, New England planters and their feelings about um, the American Revolution. You know, if we think, you know, a lot of them are only, you know, about 15 years removed from being uh, settlers of New England um, and their feelings about being loyal to the crown and, and things like that. So that might be a good source to, to pursue, and that's available on archive.org. Great, thanks. Uh, let's see. Um, Joy asks any suggestions about getting unstuck on more common names of people. The sons, fathers, uncles all seem to have the same name. It's a very good question. Um, whenever I'm working with folks, um, either with uh, you know a common name or the same given name that's repeated within a family, I like to make timelines for folks. Um, and so this is something that you can do in Excel, where you um, you know record the timeline of their life, when you think they were born, when they're married, who they're um, buying and selling land from, if they're witnessing deeds. Um, of particular people. Um, and that'll help you to determine their, you know, family members and their associates. And it may help you to, um, um, you know, kind of provide distinctions between people with the same names. Um, so it's, it's, it's certainly is tough going in Nova Scotia when you're working with a small pool of resources, but it's the best way um, to kind of organize folks, because you'll see a pattern of that person interacting with the same 10 people. Um, so one John Brown's interacting with, you know, um, these same people, and then this Thomas Brown Jr. is interacting with these people. It kind of helps you to delineate each person. 
Uh, now, Douglas asks, did any dislocated Acadians who were sent to New England return to Nova Scotia with the planters? Um, that's a very good question. I And again, I would look at the subject guide, but I do believe that that a lot of the uh, that some Acadians were invited back in the 1760s. I mean, you do see folks kind of float back to the Maritimes. Um, and you know, you you will see find a descendants of, of Acadians in Can uh, the Maritimes today, particularly in New Brunswick. Um, I don't know if they specifically kind of came with the um, the New England planters, but I do know that they kind of trick trickled back, you know, starting in the 1760s and 1770s. But again, I would I would look at that subject guide um, and the sources um, that Trisha suggests for further reading. All right, just a few more questions. Um, Janice asks, does the township's name have any relationship to the origin of the settlers? That is a very good question. Not that I, not to my knowledge, like I believe, you know, Cornwallis Township was named for Governor Cornwallis. Um, you know, not to my knowledge, I, I believe that they're kind of named for um, prominent folks. Um, but again, Esther Clark writes Planters and Pioneers. She does the best job of breaking up um, these townships because some, you know, the, the townships along Minus Bay, the Minus Basin are kind of all related to each other. Um, and she does a great job of of explaining the historical township, who who is coming and settling in them. Um, and there's probably some more information maybe about um, the naming of the townships. But yeah, this, it's a good question. I mean, it's it's important to look for any kind of bits of, of details um, that you, we can get our hands on. But again, you know, her source is is the uh, should be the springboard um, for all of your research. All right, Kathy asks, are there uh, New England town records about their citizens leaving? So might you find um, some information in, in either town records or perhaps even church records noting that their citizens are leaving and heading to Nova Scotia? That's a very good question. And it's not something that I know off the, the top of my head. I mean, you you might find, um, I, I'm thinking about the Connecticut Congregational Church Record Collection. Um, that you can find on Ancestry that's it's called Connecticut Church Abstracts. Some of those churches recorded um, dismissals, you know, admissions and dismissals. So you might see families being kind of dismissed. Um, and it is possible that, you know, kind of the consideration of this, the, the proclamation and the planning for these folks to go up to Nova Scotia does appear in local New England town records. It's a really great thought. Um, and, and if you can, you know, determine exactly where your ancestor is coming from, it's definitely, definitely worth a look. I mean, it's, it would be very interesting to see if that happened. All right, maybe just one final question. Um, and that's uh, working with the Nova Scotia archives. I mean, throughout the presentation you've given, um, you've noted several collections, some that are digitized, some that may be only on microfilm or only available at the Nova Scotia archives. Is there a way to work with them um, to either request lookups or for them to do research on your behalf? How might you be able to work from them remotely? Um, that's a great question. I, I mean, I, I believe that they maintain a list of genealogists that you could hire to to look at the collections up there for you. To my knowledge, I do not believe they have a lookup service. Um, but again, I could be wrong. Things could have changed um, kind of during the um, the COVID era. Um, I, you know, it's always worth reaching out, calling the archivists, talking to them on the phone, or or sending them a, a quick email. Um, but again, I do believe in, and you know, this is something that I often do. I'll, I'll ask, you know, do you have a list of, of known genealogists that I could hire to, to kind of look at something on my behalf? And most archives do maintain that list. Um, it's, it's, it's frustrating because, um, you know, so much great stuff is up in Halifax and it can be tricky to get your hands on. Um, but again, there, there might be some ways to get around that. And then I always suggest calling or emailing the archivist. 
All right. Well, thank you again, Shayla, for an absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and all of this information. Again, for everyone listening at home, uh, this program has been recorded, so you can watch a recording. You can rewatch a recording as many times as you like. You can pause it. You can take screenshots. Um, and you'll find that on our website at AmericanAncestors.org, as well as our YouTube channel. And I will be sending you an email once that recording is posted and a link to how to access it. And of course, there's also a free handout. Um, I shared that link in the chat early on, but once again, I will include that in my follow-up email, um, as well as the description on our website and YouTube channel. So you can find uh, the full URLs that maybe you missed or weren't able to write down very quickly, um, as well as some other information and other resources. Um, and of course, if we didn't get to your question today, there are other ways that uh, we can assist you. We do research for hire. Um, and if you're interested in that service, you can contact research at nehgs.org. Maybe you've hit a brick wall. Maybe you're uh, attempting to um, apply for a lineage society. Um, maybe you're having trouble deciphering old handwriting. We can certainly help you. And again, you can just contact research at nehgs.org. Or if you have um, maybe a quick reference question, you can also chat with our genealogists through our online chat service, which is available for free and open to the public uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 9 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. And that can be accessed through our website and at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create others uh, for you and audiences around the world. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Best of luck in your research, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.